Okay, yes, good morning again. So um, we are wrapping up with our Heroes of Faith today. It's our last time. Um, that this does not mean that you cannot look up other Heroes of Faith and see how they, uh, how different people use their faith in action or even everyday people like you and me. Um, well, they, th those are the Heroes of Faith, though. They're everyday people like you and me who have done something um, living out their faith lives where then they get known for it. So we will probably never be known for our faith, but we are known in the kingdom for our faith. So there we go. Any hoosie. So today we're finishing with the heroes of forgiveness. And um, I don't know how many of you know the story of Corey Ten Boom. Yes, no, maybe. Okay. And uh, she wrote The Hiding Place. Um, I think that she, uh, she exemplifies forgiveness uh, amazingly, which we'll hear. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about her, then we're going to jump into scripture, and then we'll jump back to her after that, I think. We hope so. I will. I'm working towards it. Okay. So, Cory ten Boom is a Dutch, bless you, Dutch woman, um, grew up, uh, in Holland, um, when she was 52 years old, she, well, back it up, four years, in 1940, when the Nazis invaded Holland, um, she and her family, who were very faithful people, they realized they needed to do something to help uh, the Jewish people in their community, and so they would get extra rations, um, they had kind of an underground network going, they hid Jewish people in their, uh, in their house, um, and they all told, um, it's estimated that they helped to save approximately 800 Jewish people in Holland. So they were living out their faith as a family. Um, it was just incredible. I, if you have not read The Hiding Place, I highly recommend it. Amazing, amazing story. Um, and lots of really good tidbits of wisdom in there, which is um, fascinating. It's one of those can't put down sort of books. So I highly recommend it. Um, so when she was 52 uh, and her dad was 84 and it was her, her dad and her sister who all lived in the same house and were helping these Jewish people and uh, they were betrayed by one of their countrymen and the Nazis came in and arrested her and her father and her sister and, uh, and they were sent to concentration camps at 52. Now, I don't know what the average age in here is. Some of you may have seen 52 come and go. Some of you are looking towards it. But, oh, we've got a thumbs up. Higher, higher. <laughs> but just imagine 52, Europe, uh, heading into this kind of unknown, into this uh, arrest. And... Um, her 84-year-old uh, father did end up dying at one of the concentration camps. Um, but we're going to just, I'm going to read a little bit from her book to you so we get an idea of what she experienced. Um, where's my first bookmark? Here we go. Uh, da -da 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 -da. So this is, this is, they had already been to two concentration camps. They were in concentration camps for a period of 10 months. Um, she was released after 10 months, but, uh, but this is the third one, Ravensbrück. And this was a not, not good place. This is, they had heard tales of how bad this concentration camp was, and, and that's where they were headed. For two more incredible days and two more nights, we were carried deeper and deeper into the land of our fears. Now, mind you, they are on a train. They're not in nice little seats. They're kind of shoved into cattle cars. Um, no room to sit or lay down. Her sister is incredibly ill and weak. Um, she was a little stronger. Um, so they were just trying to figure out how to best ride. And, and this is in two days and two nights, standing in a cattle, a cattle car just crammed with other women. Um, occasionally, one of the loaves of bread was passed from hand to hand, but not even the most elementary provision had been made for sanitation, and the air in the car was such that few could eat. And gradually, more terrible than the crush of bodies and the filth, 
The single obsession was something to drink. Two or three times when the train stopped, the door was slid open a few inches and a pail of water passed in. But we had become animals, incapable of plan or system. Those near the door got it all. At last, the morning of the fourth day, the train stopped again. Four days crammed into this cattle car. And the door was opened its full width. Like infants on hands and knees, we crawled to the opening and lowered ourselves over the side. In front of us was a smiling blue lake. On the far side, among sycamore trees, rose a white church steeple. The stronger prisoners hauled buckets of water from the lake. We drank through cracked and swollen lips. The train was shorter. The cars carrying the men had disappeared. Only a handful of soldiers, some of them looking no older than 15, were there to guard a thousand women. No more were needed. We could scarcely walk, let alone resist. After a while, they got us into straggly columns and marched us off. For a mile, the road followed the shore of the lake, then left it to climb a hill. I wondered if Betsy, that's her sister, Betsy. I wondered if Betsy could make it to the top, but the sight of trees and sky seemed to have revived her and she supported me as much as I her. We passed a number of local people on foot and in horse-drawn wagons. The children especially seemed wonderful to me, pink-cheeked and healthy. They returned my stares with wide-eyed interest. I noticed, however, that the adults did not look at us, but turned their heads away as we approached. <coughs> I think that's a very telling tale um, of the blinding eye purposefully. Those adults knew this was wrong. They knew these people were being um, tortured. They had spent at least four days on those cattle cars, crammed in there, no real food. Uh, most of them had nothing to drink, and they were expected to walk a mile uphill part of the way, making it into this next concentration camp. Fridays, the recurrent humiliation of medical inspection. The hospital corridor in which we waited was unheated, and a fall chill had settled into the walls. Still, we were forbidden even to wrap ourselves in our own arms, but had to maintain our erect hands at sides position as we filed slowly past a phalanx of green, grinning guards. How there could have been any pleasure in the sight of these stick-thin legs and hunger-bloated stomachs, I could not imagine. Surely there is no more wretched sight than the human body unloved and uncared for, nor could I see the necessity for the complete undressing. When we finally reached the examining room, a doctor looked down each throat, another, a dentist presumably, at our teeth, a third in between each finger. And that was all. We trooped again down the long, cold corridor and picked up our X-marked dresses at the door. All these women, every single week, had to just file through completely naked, completely vulnerable, completely bare. And these guards would just smile. <clears throat> smile. I love how Corey says, I don't, I don't understand how anyone could find pleasure in this. And yet she stood, stood strong, um, helped, her, helped her sister the whole time. Um, this is another excerpt from here. Uh, this is their actual barracks, where they lived. Barracks 8 was in the quarantine camp compound. Next to us, perhaps as a deliberate warning to newcomer, newcomers, were located the punishment barracks. From there, all day long and often into the night, came the sounds of hell itself. They were not the sounds of anger or of any human emotion, but of a cruelty altogether detached, blows landing in regular rhythm, screams keeping pace. We would stand in our ten deep ranks with our hands trembling at our sides, longing to jam them against our ears to make the sounds stop. It grew harder and harder. Even within these four walls, there was too much misery, too much seemingly pointless suffering. Every day, something else failed to make sense. Something else grew too heavy. Every day, the sun rose a little later. The bite took longer to leave the air. It will be better, everyone assured everyone else. When we move into the permanent barracks, we'll have a blanket apiece, a bed of our own. The move to the permanent quarters came the second week in October. So it's getting colder and colder as this time progresses. 
We were marched 10 abreast along the wi uh, wide Cinder Avenue. Several times the column halted while numbers were read out. Names were never used at Ravensbrook. At last, Betsy's and mine were called. We stepped out of line with a dozen or so others and stared at the long gray front of Barracks 28. Betsy and I followed a prisoner guide through our door at the right. Because of the broken windows, the vast room was in semi-twilight. Our noses told us first that the place was filthy. Somewhere, plumbing had backed up. The bedding was soiled and rancid. Then our eyes adjusted to the gloom. We saw that there were no individual beds at all but great square tiers stacked three high and wedged side by side and end to end with only an occasional narrow aisle slicing through. We followed our guide single file. The aisle was not wide enough uh, for two, fighting back the claustrophobia of these platforms rising everywhere above us. At last, she pointed to a second tier in the center of a large block. To reach it, we had to stand on the bottom level, haul ourselves up, and then crawl across three other straw-covered platforms to reach the one that we would share with how many. The deck above us was too close to let us sit up. We lay back, struggling against the nausea that swept over us from the reeking straw. Suddenly, I sat up, striking my head on the cross slats above. Something had pinched my leg. Fleas, I cried. Betsy, the place is swarming with them. Nonstop, they were covered with fleas, with lice. There were roaches in all the other places constantly bugs everywhere. We scambled across the intervening platforms, heads low to avoid another bump, dropped down to the aisle and hedged our way to a patch of light. They were in what we would consider hell on earth. They had no real warmth. The, I never use this. I'm going to use it now. The, oh, I'm not going to do it right. The beds were just these bunk beds like that, and these tight rows, and you would fit um, at least five women, at least five women on these little beds. They would be sleeping nearly on top. The only, the only saving grace in this sleeping arrangement was that they would have some body heat, a little bit of body heat to keep each other warm. Truly, truly a hell on earth. Um, I say that, when you read this book, you will also see the hand of God everywhere throughout their experience. Um, and, uh, and the fleas are one of those. Her sister Betsy says, oh, we need to thank the Lord for the fleas. And she says, no, mm -mm. nope, this is where I'm drawing the line. I'm not thanking the Lord for the fleas. But it, comes to, or it turns out that uh, they would hold a Bible study every single night with a Bible that they miraculously smuggled in. And, uh, and the only reason the guards would not go in that barracks to break up the Bible study was because of the fleas. So God's hand truly was in every moment of this. He was with them in their suffering and would provide um, for them in that suffering at every turn. It, it, I, I highly recommend... Um, as you study the World War II, study the Holocaust, um, have your kids or grandkids study it, bring them back to a book like this, because a lot of people use the Holocaust as a reason to prove God's non-existence. If God existed, there wouldn't be such times as the Holocaust, but this, this book shows how God's hand was still there, still with them, still providing for them, and still loving them. So I highly recommend um, looking at this book or, or some of her other books. Just incredible. Um, yes? So he's saying that most cattle cars have some openings, some, some slats. This. See, my drawing is good. Her drawing is good. <laughs> the way you got the cattle car, it's, it's, it's most of them are got slats like this. So they have little slats in so here, so they're not, exposed to the weather as well. So anyone who can't hear him, he's just reminding us that most cattle cars are open, have some sort of 
um, slats some exposure to the weather, which these women also would have had to endure. Um, so. Right, they're, they're malnourished, they have no drink, and they're exposed to weather for, and not sitting, they're standing that whole time. Um, the biggest problem was Betsy's strength. One morning after a hard night's rain, we arrived to find the ground sodden and heavy. Betsy had never been able to lift much. Today, her shovels full were microscopic, and she stumbled frequently as she walked to the low ground where we dumped the loads. A guard screamed at her, can't you go faster? Why must they scream, I wondered. A voice coming from the bell-shaped speaker, a scream lingering in the air even after Betsy had leapt to shut it off. Loafer, lazy swine. The guard snatched Betsy's shovel from her hands and ran from group to group of the digging crew, exhibiting the handful of dirt that was all Betsy could, had been able to lift. Look at what Madame Baroness is carrying. Surely she will overexert herself. So he's mocking her um, for the little bit that she can do. The other guards and even some of the prisoners laughed. Encouraged, the guard threw herself into a parody of Betsy's faltering walk. A male guard was with our detail today, and in the presence of a man, the women guards were always animated. As the laughter grew, I felt a murderous anger inside. The guard was young and well-fed. Was it Betsy's fault that she was old and starving? But to my astonishment, Betsy, too, was laughing. That's me, all right, she admitted, but you'd better let me totter along with my little spoonful or I'll have to stop altogether. The guard's plump cheeks went crimson. I'll decide who's to stop. And snatching the leather crop from her belt, she slashed Betsy across the chest and neck. Without knowing what I was doing, I seized my shovel and rushed at her. Betsy stepped in front of me before anyone had seen. Corey, she pleaded, dragging my arm to my side. Corey, keep working. She tugged the shovel from my hand and dug it into the mud. Contemptuously, the guard tossed Betsy's shovel toward us. I picked it up, still in a daze. A red stain appeared on Betsy's collar. A welt began to swell on her neck. Betsy saw where I was looking and laid a bird-thin hand over the whip mark. Don't look at it, Corey. Look at Jesus only. She drew her hand away. It was sticky with blood. Malnourished. Uh, no real uh, hydration. Constantly exposed to the elements. Expected to do hard labor beaten whenever, forced to do these humiliating medical checkups every single week. It can't get worse. Death seemed uh, a release. It seemed a kindness to be able to leave that. So now we're going to jump to scripture. We'll come back to this momentarily. Um, I just wanted to kind of lay the groundwork of what they were experiencing in this concentration camp. So let's go to um, 2 Samuel uh, in the Old Testament. It's after 1 Samuel. <laughs> uh, <laughs> after, after Judges, after Ruth. Um, it's, it's after the Pentateuch. So you've got Deuteronomy as the end of the first five books. And then go a couple more and you'll get to 2 Samuel chapter 11. If anyone has the page number of the Pew edition, you can holler it out. 263. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. So the Bible, uh, the Bible character or person that we're going to study today is David. Um, I bring him up with good reason. We're going to read about David's uh, sin here. So picking up in verse, or in, uh, in chapter 11. In the spring of the year, uh, the time when the kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammon Ammon Ammonites and besieged Reba, but David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about the, on the tin roof on the roof of the king's house, excuse me, that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived, 
And she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah and to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the people fared and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, you have just come from a journey. Why did you not go down to your house? He's trying to get Uriah to be with Bathsheba so that that pregnancy is covered up and there's no sin known. Uriah said to David, the ark in Israel and Judah remain in booths. And my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to Uriah, remain here today also and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence and make him drunk. And in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his lord, but he did not go down to his house. Still, he won't comply. He's being a good servant of David's. He's being a soldier and remaining faithful to the king. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter, he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him so that he may be struck down and die. Now we're plotting murder. As Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there, was a valiant war there were valiant warriors. The men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite was killed as well. Then Joab sent and told David all the news about the fighting, and he instructed the messenger, when you have finished telling the king all the news about the fighting, then if the king's anger rises, and if he says to you, why did you go so near the city to fight? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, son of, oh, these names, Jerubal? Did not a woman throw an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died at Thebes? Why did you go so near the wall? Then you shall say, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead too. So he delivers that message. He knows that Uriah is dead. And uh, when the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, jumping down to verse 26, she made lamentation for him. When the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. These are biggies. These are what we consider big sins, right? Adultery, murder, cover-up. This is big. If this happened in today's age, this would be all over the news. And we would hear a lot of people uh, condemning David, condemning Bathsheba. Um, they'd be in a lot of trouble. And, uh, and we consider those big sins. And it's pointed out to David. The prophet Nathan points out his sin to him. And he realizes... And something that uh, I think that you may know, you may not know, um, when you've sinned, which we all do, um, when you sin, doesn't it hurt? It hurts physically. You can't eat, you can't sleep. Um, if you've murdered someone, I don't know how you couldn't not run and confess to someone, tell someone. It, it physically hurts to bear the burden of sin. Flip over to Psalm 51. If you open up your Bible to the middle, you'll almost be there. Um, so Psalm 51. So these sins are what are the, the driving force behind Psalm 51. David writes his confession out in this psalm. And, okay, and I say this all the time, but this really is my favorite. Pretty sure. I love this. I love this because it is so bold, so honest, and he lays it all out there. Let's read it. 
Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Who else has the mercy? Who else is able to forgive as David needs that forgiveness but the Lord? Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Again, do you hear that? We talk about this all the time, that we sin when we sin. We are sinning against God, and we are absolutely worthy of his wrath. And yet, with David, we cry for that same mercy. We cry for that forgiveness from the only one who can offer us mercy. Indeed, verse 5, Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner, when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. There's that physical, physical response, the bones crushing um, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. This is my favorite verse. Cle- uh, create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Who can do that? We cannot do that for ourselves. We cannot create a new and right spirit for ourselves at all. We're born in sin. We're born guilty. The only one who can create in us a clean and right spirit, is the Lord. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. The Lord wants us to come to him begging for that mercy. The Lord wants to lavish us with redemption with forgiveness oh my gosh these are the big sins the what we consider the big sins that david is confessing and asking for forgiveness (coughs) and do we know what happens with david he absolutely has to deal with the earthly consequences of this but out of his branch we get the ultimate forgiveness. We get Jesus out of the branch of David. If God can forgive David, surely, surely he can forgive us. So now, we're going to go back to Corey. And what does this mean in her life. What what did this mean in her life, and what does this mean in our life? So does anyone remember, oh, again, small catechism pop quiz. You know, I do this. You should all just keep going with your small catechisms, right? Okay, who remembers in the Lord's Prayer, the fifth petition, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and what does this mean oh i thought i thought you were raising your hand okay we pray in this petition that our father in heaven would not look at our sins or deny our prayer because of them we are neither worthy of the things for which we pray nor have we deserved them but we ask that he would give them all to us by grace 
For we daily sin much and surely deserve nothing but punishment. So we too will sincerely forgive and gladly do good to those who sin against us. So we read about the horrors or some of the horrors that Corey experienced. Her dad died. Her sister died. Her, her sister was beaten in front of her. Um, she was malnourished. She was mocked and laughed at. She was humiliated. She was exposed to the elements. And what happened? It was at a church service in Munich that I saw him. This is post-war. The former SS man who had stood guard at the shower room door in the processing center at Ravensbrück. He was the first of our actual jailers that I had seen since that time, and suddenly it was all there. The room full of mocking men, the heaps of clothing, Betsy's pain-blanched face. He came up to me as the church was emptying, beaming and bowing, how grateful I am for your message, Fraulein, he said, to think that, as you say, he has washed my sins away. His hand was thrust out to shake mine, and I, who had preached so often to the people in Blumendahl, the need to forgive kept my hand at my side. Even as the angry, vengeful thoughts boiled through me, I saw the sin of them. Jesus Christ had died for this man. Was I going to ask for more? Lord Jesus, I prayed, forgive me and help me to forgive him. I tried to smile. I struggled to raise my hand. I could not. I felt nothing, not the slightest spark of warmth or charity. And so again, I breathed a silent prayer. Jesus, I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. As I took his hand, the most incredible thing happened. From my shoulder along my arm and through my hand, a current seemed to pass from me to him, while into my heart sprang a love for this stranger that almost overwhelmed me. And so I discovered that it is not on our forgiveness any more than our goodness that the world's healing hinges, but on his. When he tells us to love our enemies, he gives, along with the command, the love itself. She had gone to hell, an earthly hell, and this man who created that hell, part of that hell for her, he stood before her saying, oh, it was a great message. I heard that Jesus forgives my sins through your lips. How was she supposed to forgive this man? But notice it's not out of her power that she forgives, is it? It's out of Jesus. It's out of the love of Christ, the forgiveness that we have in Christ, that she was able to extend forgiveness to that man. And she was overcome with love for this man who had put her through hell, and she could Forgive him, truly forgive him, because she had that strength from Jesus. So, what that means for us in our own lives, when we pray that prayer, we pray it every single week. Probably a lot of us pray it at home daily. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's not out of our own power, but we are called to forgive. And I love how she brings it back to Jesus. If Jesus already died for the person who has sinned against you, if Jesus has forgiven those sins, certainly we can call on him to help us to forgive. Because often when we hold on to that sin against us, we too are burdened and we hold on to it and we bear the weight of that sin. 
and we have no release of that. So, as we go forth, as we think about the heroes of faith, whether it's strength or peace or mercy or forgiveness, we can turn every single time to realize that our strength, that our peace, that any mercy we may have and forgiveness that we may give truly is sourced at the cross, truly is sourced in Jesus Christ. Because the hell that they endured, the sin that we endure, whether we commit it or we are sinned against, it was already dealt with on the cross. It was already overcome through Jesus Christ. And we can take that into our daily lives to live out our faith. We don't have to be amazing heroes. We don't have to become famous to live our faith. Because when we are living out our faith, it is known in the kingdom. It's known to those around us. And that should be good enough. So go forth, forgive, <laughs> be forgiven. <laughs> Confess, oh, read, read David. I love that confession, 51, Psalm 51, Psalm 51. And I think that's it, two minutes over. Not too bad. <laughs> Please forgive me. <laughs>